How do you transform a cavernous cold church into a futuristic house? Or turn a dilapidated old barn into a stylish family home? From industrial wonders to ancient windmills, this series follows brave homeowners. The original wall has come away from the chapel. As they take on the seemingly impossible challenges. That isn't going to happen until next year, never mind three weeks' time. You're absolutely barreling down. Of transforming historic structures never built to be lived in. We explore the master crafts and ingenious modern design it takes to build an impossible house. It's another bit of history saved. In this episode, an ambitious family man... I'm fairly confident it will work. I may be the only person who is confident it will work. Battles sinking foundations... Bounce on that, Pete. That's not bad, Pete. It's not good, but it's not bad. Rotting timber. I don't think it would fall down, but you never can be too sure, can you? And tight deadlines. It's costing us a bit more than we hoped. To transform this never lived in 200 year old barn. There have been times when it's felt rather like there's been less barn here than there was before we started. Into a show stopping family home. In Bury St Edmunds, Suffolk, Peter Kilner is about to take on a passion project of a lifetime. A retired GP, Peter has a love of all things wood. He, along with his wife Julie, live in this charming 18th century cottage. The cottage was run down when they bought it in 2015, but over three years, Peter meticulously renovated it into a comfortable family home. The site also came with this Grade two listed timber barn that's seen better days. My intention was that we should live in the cottage and that I would have the barn as a very large and luxurious workshop, studio, store. Although we love the cottage and it's a very, very beautiful cottage, we realised our eventual house would be better in the barn where we would have more space and more freedom. The barn is typical of the design found in the Suffolk countryside. It's located at the bottom of a hill and the surrounding farmland is mostly clay soil. It was built 200 years ago on stone and lime mortar foundations. The base of the barn's walls are built from brick and flint and it's topped with a slate roof. It's a huge 3,300 foot space that up until 150 years ago was used as a threshing barn. Large doors allowed vehicles to enter and deposit their cargo of wheat. A horse-powered threshing machine processed the crops. The thresher separated the wheat from the chaff and filled bags of grain that would be used for flour, cattle feed or brewing. The introduction of steam engines and machinery out in the farm fields in the 1850s heralded the end of the traditional timber barn as a storage and processing building. This barn probably went out of service around the same time. And although the structure has deteriorated over the years, it's thought the layout is as it was when it was abandoned. This, we think, is part of the original barn, although it may have been put on a bit later, perhaps in the latter part of the 19th century. It's on the south side of the barn with a lovely outlook. And we have these wide openings all along the south side, which lend themselves to large glazing. So our intention is to have the kitchen there, an eating area here in the middle, and here where I've got my temporary workshop, a sitting area. The setting of the barn is one of the really good things about it. We would hope to keep it looking reasonably natural. We don't want a very formal garden, but we do love open views and wildflowers and water in particular, I think, makes a wonderful focal point for any view. 
After years of neglect, transforming this agricultural ruin that never even had running water, let alone electricity, into a 21st century home is an enormous challenge. Peter has a budget of £450,000, which might sound healthy, but a build of this scale could eat that up very quickly. Peter plans to exploit the barn's vast open space. The old barn doors will become a grand double-height entrance that leads onto the dining room. The old lean-to will become a kitchen diner. Two wing extensions will become spare bedrooms. A central staircase will lead upstairs to a sitting room and master bedroom with ensuite that have views across the rolling Suffolk countryside. Peter also wants to turn the old barn pond into a natural swimming pool in order to complete the timber barn's transformation into a modern home. Work begins to save the structure, starting with the foundations. Peter's brother-in-law, Tony, a former builder, will oversee the construction. When it was a barn, I don't think anybody was worried, but now it's going to be a habitable dwelling. You've got to protect the foundations from being washed away by the water eventually. The barn sits at the bottom of a hill. So in heavy rain, water collects around the building, gradually eroding the stone and lime foundations. To save the barn from collapse, Tony must collect the water in a 100-foot-long drain to divert the water away from the foundations and into a sewer under the road. Tony has already dug a trench next to the barn and laid drainage pipes that are connected to the main sewer. Today, they are being set into the ground. Peter's hiring contractors to help Tony whenever he needs them. Today, we have two concrete lorries booked. We hope that the pipe will be completely buried and there will be a secure base for the wall of the barn and it won't fall into the road. The pipe needs to be set at the right depth and angle to meet the drain and then the sewer. Unfortunately, the concrete is causing the pipe to flow upwards, so it's now misaligned to the embedded pipe there. So it's a bit of a dilemma. Look how much that's gone. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. Oh, that's, that is a... That's, a, you know... So-and-so, isn't it? So, OK. Whether you can phone up uh, one of the farmers, see if he'll come around with his telehandler, and that's well, what come out. Um, we, if, if we get a couple of us um, yeah. on that end, I think we can lift it. But it's got to come out, Pete, because that's yeah. 10 yeah. inches out now. Yeah. Ready? Yep. Not quite as planned, but that's the way it goes. The problem is that the concrete was so fluid that it flowed under the pipe and lifted the pipe right up, which meant that it wouldn't work as a, a drainage pipe. So we're trying to get the liquid concrete out and put it back down and put some dryer mix on top. It's amazing how quick it goes in. <laughs> Not so quick coming out. Just bang the top of that pipe. Hey! <laughs> if we bounce on that Pete. <laughs> that's, not, that's not bad, Pete. It's not good, but it's not bad. Yeah, good. So it's now back down, settled out, not as low as it was, but still pretty good. So now we'll bring the big lorry back flood the top of it with a dry mix, and that would job them. It's a big relief to see it all buried, and more or less at the right level, I think. I don't think it will erode anymore. Should last another couple of hundred years. It's now two months since work began. The perimeter walls are up, and the roof is being rebuilt. I was worried about starting so late in the year, but uh, so far, so good. 
most important thing is to get the shell of the main barn as strong and weathertight as possible before the weather breaks. Chris Looms leads the team of roofers racing to make the structure watertight before the winter. They must carefully remove all the tiles, repair the trusses, cover with a waterproof membrane, and put the slates back on. It's leaked over the years, there's been problems with it, so you have to take your, take your time, basically, and take everything off in piece, piece by piece, really, and work your way back up from there. We'll probably save around sort of 30 to 40 per cent of what's here, which will go down on the lower roof somewhere out the way, so it still gets used on site. So it's keeping some of the history of the building here. They may be able to reuse some of the old roof, but the replacement slates, timber and installation will eat up around £200,000, nearly half of Peter's budget. It's a painstaking process, but he wants to preserve as much of the original structure as possible, including the timber cladding. This is made up of a mixture of elm, chestnut and pine that the carpenters are working hard to save, repair or replace when necessary. They will have to take all the boards off the east wall and the west wall because they're badly deteriorated. But before they remove them, they're going to put some temporary strengthening battens across the existing stud work so that hopefully it won't blow down. This will be stripped off. It's just rotten. It's got woodworm all in it. I'm trying to preserve these timbers behind because they haven't really taken much of a battery. Peter wants to keep as much as he possibly can, but these are just beyond repair. To leave these boards on would just be pretty pointless, really. They must remove the timbers and slates with extreme care to prevent damaging the structure. I don't think it would fall down, but you never can be too sure, can you? You've, it's always better to be safe than sorry. While work continues on the barn, Peter maps out plans for the grounds. He loves nature and he likes swimming, so he has an ambitious scheme to build a pool to blend in with the surroundings. I'm trying to convert what was a natural pond into a natural swimming pond in a way that is as eco-friendly as possible. I've decided to make it all of timber. There was a natural pond here, and the soil is mostly boulder clay, which actually retains water very well without any other kind of artificial lining being put in. I'll put some boarding behind the framework. I'll feed in some stone. The whole framework will eventually be submerged about 20 or 30 centimetres under the water. Building any kind of pool without a waterproof lining is brave, to say the least. Peter has drained the old pond and dug out the clay to make it deeper. Below the intended water line, he's building a timber frame and ramming stones tightly into the clay for extra support. At one end, he's installing a pump chamber to filter the water and maintain the water level. Now all he has to do is hope that his makeshift barrier will hold and stop the pump chamber and barn from getting wet feet. I'm fairly confident it will work. I may be the only person who is confident it will work. Uh, I haven't really talked to anybody else who's built a, a wooden swimming pond. It takes two months for Peter to single-handedly build the barrier and fill the pond with water. But after all his hard work, his hopes are shattered. The water has seeped through the barrier and is leaking into the pump chamber. Peter's principle was that because, you know, we're way below ground level, that the pond would be within the clay line and therefore hold the water. The problem is Pete set the water level slightly higher than the clay line and therefore the water is leaking into the pump chamber. We're going to have to lower the level of the pond. Um, I'm going to do that now by taking out this pipe here, exposing the end of a lower pipe, which goes down to the lower pond. There it goes. <laughs> we'll drain about two feet of water, which will be sufficient, hopefully, to dry the pump chamber and then commence the resealing process.
They are now four months into the build. The winter weather makes progress slow going. The swimming pond is still leaking, and the shell of the barn isn't watertight. Costing us a bit more than we hoped and taking a bit longer than we hoped, but I'm still hopeful that at least the main barn will be done by next winter and we'll be able to move in. Oh, God, wind. We held up a little bit with the weather. Obviously, it was icy, so we couldn't get on for a bit. Well, as soon as the wind. <laughs> it was touch and go, actually, whether to carry on today. Was, I thought, shall we or shan't we? But we've made a call on it. We're pretty much sheltered on this side out of the way. The other side's really exposed. It's, it's, it's OK, this side. Do you want to go around now? It takes until the spring to repair all 6,000 slate roof tiles and 430 square feet of oak, tongue and groove timber cladding to finally shield the inside from the elements. They've cleaned the timber cladding inside, added a floor for the upstairs, and the layout is beginning to take shape. Peter put in new drains to save the foundations, but a suspicious damp patch has appeared in the barn, so he's had to build an additional drain. We've had this strain dug out over the last week. The water level has come down from about there down to an inch or two above the concrete base. And we hope perhaps over the course of the next week it will seep away altogether. And we can feed some concrete in to strengthen this weakened wet corner. The concrete, when it goes down, will start to bring the whole building together and make it look more like a house than a barn. It uh, will be encouraging to have got to that stage. There have been times when it's felt rather like there's been less barn here than there was before we started. Following the changes in farming since the 1950s, the conversion of disused barns into dwellings has increased. Their high vaulted ceilings, exposed beams, open plan spaces, and large windows that flood the inside with light have made them a popular choice. The combination of ultra modern interiors, large communal kitchens, and traditional rustic exteriors provide a wonderful juxtaposition of comfort and history for family life in the 21st century. It's now 10 months since Peter and the team started work on the barn. The roof is complete and the exterior timber work is on, but it still needs doors, windows and interior fittings, and the bills are adding up. We have rather um, compromised our finances and have decided that from this point on, we are going to take on much of the work ourselves. Pete obviously had a budget originally, and he had a budget for the design and build, but the design was, well, it is a staggeringly beautiful design. But to have one contractor do this entire project is probably a million pound build. So for now, Peter and brother-in-law Tony will be doing all the work themselves. I was a builder for a while, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Retired now. Uh, and when Pete started this, it, it's like, a, you know, I love it, really. And you know, I just come over to help out. I thoroughly enjoy it. I don't want any payment. I just come over and help him. I'm looking forward to the next few months, hoping that we can get it together. Today, Peter and Tony are working inside the rebuilt lean-to extension that will house the kitchen. They're putting in steel beams which will hold up the roof, then covering them with the original trusses to maintain the historic look. There will be some minor trimming of the trusses to get them to fit both ends, and then we have to make sure that the props supporting them at each end are strong enough and straight enough to do the job. I'll keep you fit, Tony. 
You're doing well, mate. You're doing well. Keep going. Would you? Looking good. Being a barn, the original builders didn't worry too much about making anything square. So the old truss isn't a perfect fit. We're just trying to get the beam jammed up there as high as we can. But unfortunately, it's twisted a little bit, so it's a bit of a faff, but we'll get there. Oh, hold well on up a bit. Yeah, I'll do that. What's this end here? Because it's got a bow in it, hasn't it? So, yeah, about there. There? Yeah. Yeah, that looks OK. Almost looks as if we know what we're doing. Mate, it's not too shabby at all. No, that's within that. It's level. Yeah. Oh, round of applause. <laughs> well, they're in, Pete. What do you think? Looks great, Tony. Yeah, they've done a fantastic job. They're both more or less level. They're within the line. Amazing, yeah. What do you mean, yeah. amazing, Pete? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean, might take that as a slander? <laughs> Amazing. Did you hear that, Wayne? What's that, Wayne? He said it's amazing, their level. <laughs> <laughs> I think the trusses will be a good reminder of what was here before. They tell a bit of the story of the building, so I'm well pleased. Peter wants to retain the original features in the barn, but his architect, Al, has industrial touches in mind for the interior, such as shuttered concrete, which Peter has reluctantly agreed to install. These are the two concrete walls that I'm making the base shuttering for at the moment. The concrete feature will run around the lower half of the walls in the open-plan formal dining area. To make it, Peter first builds a wooden mould, this is a watertight box that has beadwork inside to shape the concrete. He clads the inside faces of the box with Douglas fir timber. This will give the exposed surface of the concrete a grainy wood panelled look. They pour the cement mix into the mould, then bolt plywood to the back. Once set, they remove the mould and attach the panels to the walls. It takes Peter and Tony four weeks to fabricate and fit all the concrete panels. We've shuttered up to the height of about 1.7 metres. Above the concrete, we're building up stud work up to the height of the triangular roof trusses. And that stud work we're going to clad in birch ply. It's been a, a learning experience, but I've sort of got into it a bit now. The mixture of concrete and wood brings warmth to the inside as the wall panels start to divide up this cavernous space. The whole structure should be strong, and then when it's all clad in birch ply, it'll be stronger still. It was a wild idea to me, but um, I've uh, been talked into it and I now like it. Um, uh, really, I think it's keeping the idea that this was a working agricultural building built in a strong but basic way without unnecessary ornamentation. And I know Al was very keen that that ethos should be uh, kept. Peter is working hard, but even with Tony's help, progress is slow. Today, architect Al is back to check on things. Hi, Al. Good to see you. Fine, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, so we've done a bit since you last came. It's coming on. Yeah, yeah. Got the Got, glass in yeah, skylight glass. We put these old um, doors back up. They uh, slide across and we put the trusses in today. Great. Quite obsessed with these doors, actually. It's looking good. Al is clearly impressed with the attention to detail inside, but he knows Peter is far from finished. Next, the windows and doors will go in on the south elevation, and uh, then the front doors will go on, and then that, the barn will be watertight at that point. Around that time, we will insulate, lay the underfloor heating, and put the top screed down um, for the whole ground floor. 
And then there's basically all of the internal partitions, wiring, you've got not even first fix done yet. So there's, there's quite a bit to do on, on electrics and, and plumbing. I mean, I'd, I'd say we were, we were just over halfway through. Despite being severely behind schedule, Peter pushes on. Over the next few months, new windows and doors are installed. And today, brother-in-law and builder Tony is levelling the foundations for one of the extensions. This is bedroom four, so I'm just getting the ground level. And if you want to see how not to do it, Wayne's working over there in the workshop. And that's, he's like playing with sand, really. I don't think he's achieved anything level yet. Have you, Wayne? That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if we're going to have enough sand. No, I don't think we will. I've got another tonne over there by the mixer. But I don't want to bring him round again because he's levelling out, so we'll have to hand barrow it round. In an attempt to pull back the slipping build schedule, some of the barn's interior fixtures and fittings are being made off-site by master craft specialists. Metal worker Joe Bamfield is designing and building the bespoke railings that will run up the staircase and landing. They will have an industrial feel in keeping with the shuttering. The brief was quite simple. Al and Peter came with a design between them of quite a simple, minimal steel shape. It's formed of a, a mild steel angle with 12 mil steel spindles and a top rail for the timber handrail to sit on. As we're prefabricating it here in the workshop and then installing it on site, we had to do a very thorough site survey. And then with that survey, we drew up the balustrade using our CAD program. Joe needs to precision drill 99 holes in these metal strips to hold the spindles upright. It's one 12 mil hole done and only another 98 to go. The measurements are really important with a job like this. No room for error. Whenever you're making something in the workshop, that is a finished kind of piece that then gets installed on site. It can be slightly nerve-wracking whether or not it's going to fit. <laughs> it's stuck. Can't get it through. Oh, it's gone through. Just because we've got as tight a hole as possible in, the, in both sides, so it's just a little tricky to line them all up. Things like railings you can make on site but I think you often end up with a slightly higher quality product if you're fabricating in a workshop. I've given the tops and the face a nice sand so it's nice and smooth. And we're now going to apply the patina, which is an acid which etches into the surface and makes the steel go black. Peter chose that industrial steel look to complement the original features of the barn. What I like about it is that it still feels like steel. As if you paint it, you know, it has that sort of plasticky feel to it, whereas blackening it leaves it like cold, like steel. It's now just over two and a half years since work first began at the barn. The structure is finally starting to resemble an expertly restored home on a par with the cottage Peter meticulously renovated next door. The roof is complete, the windows are in, and the two wing extensions are finished. The main building work has been actually outside this part of the barn, the two north wings, they were originally there and fell down in the 1960s and 1970s, but that's why we were given planning permission to put them back again. We found it's taken a lot longer and cost rather more than we'd initially hoped, but we're getting to the stage now where things are coming together and there's an end in sight. Despite all the setbacks, Peter's love for this barn has never waned and retaining its original features has always been a priority. I quite like these doors uh, because they were the original doors for the barn when the lean-to was built, certainly been here for at least 100 years. And to save money, Peter restored the doors himself. They were still in reasonably good condition. I had to just patch up the edges with some new bits of oak and get a new sliding mechanism because they were really hanging by a thread on the old iron hinges. 
to patch up the edges of it was over 100 pounds. It's quite expensive, good quality oak. But I suspect they would cost about 1,500 pounds, 2,000 pounds to, to get made by a joiner. Peter is clearly a perfectionist and takes a methodical approach to his work. Well, I potter along all day and work some of the time and not some of the time, and, uh, and I usually carry on until about 7 o'clock in the evening and, and then sit in front of the telly. There is a lot of finishing bits and pieces, but not a great deal of decorating because so much of the old surfaces we've just left as they are and, and will stay as they are. As plasterers add the finishing touches to the walls... I like working on the barns because they're a different test of skill a little bit, at least. Joe's railings arrive for installation. Really looking forward to the railings going up. We've had a temporary barrier either side of the bridge made out of bits of two by four timber which have been pretty unsightly and uh, I'll be glad that they're going. It's going to be good. And now's the moment of truth to find out whether or not they fit. Each section weighs 55 kilos, so they build a scaffold tower and hoist to carefully lift the four pieces into place. You got it? Yeah, man, that's, that's sound. It's looking good so far. Yeah, it's absolutely bang on. That works, isn't it? That's solid. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm on. Cool. Oh, that's, that's, that's very snug. <laughs> yeah. It's a massive relief for Joe. His measurements were correct. I'm delighted with them. They're really clean and sharp and very nicely finished. I think just what I was hoping for. It's yet to have its oak handrail made and put on, which will blend them in with the old structure of the barn a little bit more. But the contrast between the accuracy and the delicacy of these and the hefty old timbers of the barn is very pleasing. In keeping with the barn's Grade II listed status, the lower sections of the exterior have been restored using traditional flint stone walling techniques. Peter uses the same materials to build the new courtyard wall to match. Inside, in the ensuite wet room, plasterer Colin is trying out an innovative technique. Traditionally used in Moroccan riads to waterproof the walls so they don't require tiling. This is my first time trying this product. It's quite challenging, to be quite honest. So you call on your 25 years of experience and you just adapt as best you can. Colin's applying a waterproof plaster to the walls, ready for the special top layer. Dip the sponge in the olive soap, and then we apply that olive soap to the wall, very gently taking the very, very top surface, and we're just creating this little slurry on the top of the wall. And then we trail that off. We're just working that into the imperfections. And that, at the end of the day, is what will give you the overall effect. We don't want anything that's completely uniform. We want things to be a little bit, little bit random, and it just gives it a little bit more luster. Today, Tony is gearing up to install Peter's futuristic lights. Now, in the old days, you used to drill a hole through the ceiling and put in a surface-mounted light, but they're not as attractive as they could be. So the modern type is this, and you have this plate which is plastered into the ceiling. So you look at the ceiling and it's nice and flat, and then you have these light fittings which go inside this plate and they're magnetic. So that's it fitted on there. So some people paint that the same colour as the ceiling. I like them, I think they're nice, and they do tilt slightly because this room by intent is the study, but it can also become another bedroom. Uh, and so then you need to have the lights tilted slightly for the ambience of the bedroom. Another area that's been a labour of love is Peter's swimming pond. 
He had a long-standing battle with the pump, so eventually replaced it with one that's designed to be submerged in water. Having a larger pond here that is big enough to swim in is good for the wildlife. We're pleased we've got a very good new population in both the ponds. Peter's desire to create an eco-sustainable environment is slowly coming to fruition, but there's still a long way to go. Two months later and two years longer than planned, Peter's build is in its final phase. Sitting proudly between the natural pond and the newly created swimming pond, surrounded by wildflowers, the barn looks magnificent. Peter was determined to preserve the historic integrity of the structure while also making it sustainable. And he's achieving just that. From the artisan flint work to the lead detail around the edge of the roof slate and the three quarter hung timber cladding, Peter is linking architecture across the ages with his use of both traditional and contemporary materials. The cathedral-like entrance is magnificent and welcoming. The expansive windows give glimpses of the old barn structure whilst reflecting its surroundings. Inside, although the main structural work has been finished, Peter still has a little way to go, but his attention to detail is unwavering. It is satisfying to walk in here and see and feel the space and the light and see the contrast between the new bits and the old bit, which we've left as near as we can to how it was originally built, but left the central portion more or less as it was, even to the extent of putting back the old stone flag flooring that was here when it was first built. The mixture of concrete and wood in the cavernous entrance hall and dining area helps divide up the vast open plan space and soften the look. I think my favorite area of the barn is this central section because there is this feeling of space and light. With views out either side, and fairly obvious contrast of the simple, even brutal modern bits against the well-aged and softened old bits. Peter has transformed what was once the old lean-to into what will be a light-filled kitchen and living area with the central focus on the spectacular outlook. When my wife and I are here by ourselves, we will hardly use the rest of the barn, but just uh, spend our days in here and in and out of the garden. And he's repaired and rehung the original doors that separated the lean-to from the main barn. Upstairs, Peter has linked the two separate spaces with a bespoke, understated bridge, which enhances the high ceilings and vastness of the barn. I'm delighted with the bridge. It has achieved simplicity and strength that we were aiming for. And hopefully, throughout the barn, and in particular on the bridge, there has been this contrast, but at the same time, harmony between minimalistic, light, modern design and traditional, old, heavy timber, brick and flint design of the original barn. Throughout the barn, new double glazed windows make imposing frames around the original structural timbers. In our case, it's because the first floor actually has much bigger windows and better light than the ground floor as we weren't allowed to penetrate the brick and flint plinth that surrounds the ground floor. We're lucky here that we've got an outlook onto our swimming pond um, facing westward so we get the sunsets in the summer and a really good view of the original timber construction of the barn. 
the upstairs living space we've decided to have no ceilings just to leave the original roof space open throughout apart from the ensuite bathroom outside the grounds are magnificent peter is striving to leave the landscape as natural as possible his property is blessed with two natural water sources and while the lower pond remains untouched, Peter's passion to create a natural swimming pond has come to life. Certainly, those around me thought it was a mad idea. It relies really on a good growth of plants in and around it to take the nutrients out of the water so that the algae won't grow. The water is still cool at the moment, but it is swimmable and I have been in a few times and hopefully be going in a lot more as the summer goes on. Peter's barn restoration is a testament to his tenacity and hard work, but the build is taking far longer than planned. The initial one that it would take a year and then my modified one that it would take us 18 months and then my modified, modified one that it would be a couple of years has now changed into three and a half years, we hope. <laughs> Certainly the outside work, the work around the swimming pond and that kind of thing is definitely going to be next year now. And his 450,000 pound budget was spent long ago. We've borrowed about another 50,000, which we have also more or less spent. We're probably going to need another 50,000 but for Peter, it's not about the schedule or the money. I particularly enjoy pottering. I, I, I think what I have found a bit difficult is working under pressure because I've clearly not been achieving what I thought I was going to achieve for the time it has taken and for the money it has cost. Peter has a clear concept of what he wants to achieve, which he is executing with love and consideration. I do have that tendency to get an idea and focus on it and feel that it I must do it for better or worse. I'm uh, fairly determined not to launch into another big building project and uh, not to move from here until I am too old frail to be here. Peter set out with an ambition of respecting the barn, its history and materials, to secure its future and create a sustainable family home. He's doing just that. <laughs>